Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I have unmuted, which is good. Um, good morning and thank you for joining us on our platform to share today. Um, some of you will have attended previous platform to share events with us and will know that they often consist of some updates in the industry, along with some presentations or demos from some of our vendors, partners and Breakwater IT staff. Uh, we have decided to change the format slightly for this year, as we are all aware that we've been spending a lot of time on video calls and webinars. So instead, we've decided to arrange more frequent but shorter events. The idea of these being that we can provide you with some useful insights or tips to help make all of our lives easier when it comes to IT. We're very much open to suggestions for future platform to share events and Sam will be sending around an email following today's session to get your feedback and to ask for any topics you may want to see covered in our upcoming webinars. She'll also include the points we cover in today's session along with a recording um, that you can send around to your staff if you wish um, and watch back in your own time. So on to today's event. Um, we often come across what we think are really useful functions or features within the office suite. Therefore, we thought it would be a good idea to share some of this knowledge with you today. We have Jordan Getley, our junior systems engineer team leader, which is a very long title. Um, he's going to show us what you can do with Outlook, things that I already know will help streamline some of the daily tasks that we all have when it comes to using our email and calendars. Then John Gothling, Breakwater's managing director, will be demoing some functions of Microsoft Word. And to finish off, Jack Fisher, our operations director, will be showing us some useful tips when it comes to creating PowerPoint documents. We were going to cover Excel as well, but we didn't want to make it about things like Excel formulas, mainly because we're just not experts in that area. But a lot of what we'll be showing today will help when using Microsoft Excel. Uh, you'll see that there's a Q&A box on the right hand screen hand of screen um, the right hand side of your screen uh, please use this to ask questions as we go along uh, we've budgeted an hour for this session today and we're probably going to fill that almost so if we don't get time to answer your questions today we'll try and pop our answers in the chat box as well but if we don't get time to answer your questions today we will follow up with that after this session uh, you'll notice that we're using microsoft teams live events this is actually the first time that we have used it, so you may just need to bear with us a little bit. Um, and just to note, there is a 20 to 30 second delay on the feed that you're seeing. So um, just bear that in mind when you're asking questions and things. We might cover it um, weirdly like 20 seconds after. So just to give you a heads up on that. Um, so, yeah, uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Jordan. Thank you. Perfect. Hi. Um, yeah, so my name is Jordan Getley. I'm obviously the junior systems engineer team leader, um, as Jordan said, very long, very long title there. Um, and today I'm going to cover some of the tips and features that not a lot of people really know about in Outlook. Um, so you should be able to see my screen. Um, we've got a demo user account set up for me to sort of show you these features as I'm going along. Um, so let's jump straight into the uh, tips and features. So the first thing that I wanted to sort of cover is a is date shortcuts in your calendar. So um, when you're scheduling in a meeting, you can essentially use specific phrases and type those into your date box to sort of bypass the need to type in your um, like a full date. So I'll show you what I mean by this. So if you go to your calendar um, and then say I wanted to schedule in a new appointment, it should open up a new box. So don't have a screen. Let me just bring that over. So we've got my new appointment here. Um, so say I wanted to book this in for Friday. I know that's tomorrow, so obviously I'd know the date. But if, if I wanted to book it in for this Friday and I didn't know what the date is, I could just type in this Friday and it would automatically fill out the box for you. Um, you can also do things like two weeks um, and things like even years and months. So you could put something in there like five years 
and we go five years in the future as well. Um, just a nice little nice little way to skip through having to find a specific date and type that in. It's very, very nice for uh, quickening that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's that feature. Let's jump into the next one, which is um, a little little shortcut that's used to mark emails as read and unread. Um, so most of you guys probably know you can mark an email as read or unread by right clicking and hitting this button here. Um, but you don't actually have to do that. You can click on this little tab here, which will mark an email as read or unread. And um, yeah, it kind of just saves you a few clicks. Um, very useful in the mornings if you come through, like especially on a Monday, if you come in after a weekend of getting a bunch of new emails, um, makes it a lot quicker for just marking emails as read very quickly instead of going through that way. Um, uh, yeah, that's that feature. So uh, the next thing I wanted to cover was um, polls in your email. So if you ever need to get feedback or opinions on a certain topic, uh, you can easily do this by adding a poll into an email. Um, so let me show you how to do that real quick. Um, so you go to new email. It's opened on my other screen, one sec. Uh, and once you're in this new email, you go to insert. And then here you'll see this little button for poll. Um, so click on that. And once it loads. You'll get a little box load up here, which will give us options to go through. Cool, so um, in this box here, you can sort of input your question. So I will just type in test question. Um, and then you have your options here, which you can fill out to whatever you want. I'm just going to leave them as option one and two for now. Um, if you ever wanted to add more options, you can click the add option box here and it'll give you some more options. And if you want to delete, uh, want to delete these options, you can just click the little bin icon to the to the right of those. Um, you can also tick this box here, which will allow people to submit multiple answers so they can tick multiple options and submit them together. But um, yeah, once you're happy with that, you just sort of click next and you get like a final preview of your uh, of your poll there. Um, if you're happy with it, you can click add to email. If you're not, click edit, but um, I'm fairly happy with it, so I'm just going to click add to email, which should do insert. So it's just going to ask me to quickly uh, choose an account to put this poll up against as well, so I might need to just quickly do that. Um, so I'm just going to click my account there. So I'll just quickly click next and add to email again. So once you do that, it should insert your poll. You'll see that it's done that because um, you can see here it says test question and then it has a link here to view or vote in browser. Um, you'll also notice it automatically fills out your subject and it also CCs you in on the email. So the reason why it CCs you is um, so you can easily access the poll and results from your inbox. Um, I'm just going to send this email to my own uh, personal breakwater address just so I can show you what it's like once you've sent it. But you can just close this box when you're ready as well. Um, so yeah, let's hit send on that and it should send out and you'll see it pop into your own inbox. So here we go. It's popped into my inbox here um, so I can easily access the results. You'll also notice here it says powered by Microsoft Forms. Uh, what that means is that uh, once you send this poll out, it will also publish to your Microsoft Forms. So you can access the poll and the results if you go into your forms or you can click on this link here and it will take you directly to your poll. Um, but yeah, that's a nice little quick way of getting um, polls set up in your emails. Um, so let's go on to the next feature, which is message previews. Um, so firstly, I'll just run through quickly what a message preview is. So this here, these are message previews, this little snippet of information that you get that says the sender, the um, subject of the email and a little bit on the message. That is your preview. Um, obviously clicking on it, you then have the preview, uh, the full email sort of appear here, or if you double click it, you can have the full email. Um, but you can actually play around with some of the settings here with the message preview, which will basically allow you to see more information um, about what the message entails. Um, so to do this, you go to view. And then you'll see this little message preview box here. So if you click on that, you'll see by default, it'll always be set to one line, but you can change it to two lines and three lines. So what I'll do is I'll change this to two lines. So as you can see here, you've got a little bit of information. Let's flick it onto two lines. Um, and it asks you where you want to change the setting. I want to change it in all mailboxes, so I'll click that. Um, clicking that, you can now see 
an additional line has just appeared down here um, on your message preview. And again, you can do it for free lines and you can see even more information there um, and you can turn it completely off. So it'll only show your the sender and the subject. Um, obviously, you can't go any further than three lines because then you'd have a, a very long list of information just going down your preview and that just wouldn't help anyone. Um, but yeah, that's the message preview feature, uh, quite a useful little one to have. Um, so yeah, the next thing that I wanted to run through is the reading pane. So it's similar to the message preview. Um, the reading pane is actually this section here. So this is your reading pane, the little snippet where you can actually see the email, like the full email before fully opening it up. Um, you can sort of change some settings with the reading pane as well. You can change where it's positioned on your screen and you can completely remove it if you don't like it. I know some people don't like the reading pane being there. Um, so to do this, uh, you also need to be in the view menu up here. So we're already in view. So what you want to do is go over to reading pane here and you'll see there's a couple options. So if you click off, you can see that the reading pane has completely disappeared and you can also position it at the bottom of your outlook as well um, as well as the right so they're they're the options that you can play around with for your reading pane very useful little thing to, to mess around with if you want to customize your outlook a little bit more um, but yeah cool so the next thing that i wanted to go through is outlook search uh, folders so if you find that you generally tend to search for a specific types of emails uh, quite often, you can set up something called an Outlook search folder. Um, these basically give you a folder down the side, left hand side here, which shows you all emails that match a certain criteria. So um, I actually set this up when I was playing around for earlier. So let me just delete this message for um, search folder and I'll quickly create one again from scratch just to show you how it works. Um, so to set up a message folder, you want to go to the folder tab up here and you can sort of click on new search folder here and it'll open up this new search folder box in the middle. Um, as you can see, Outlook gives you a bunch of templates to play around with uh, for search folders, but if you wanted, you can create your own custom search folder as well. Um, but for what I want to set up, I'm just going to use a template. So my example, I want to set up a search folder that will show me all emails that have not been read. So I'm going to use the unread mail um, template that's provided. So I highlight that. You can also choose what mailbox you want it to go into. So if you have shared mailboxes, you can put a search folder in those shared mailboxes, but I've only got my demo account, so I'm going to use that. Um, once I'm happy with that, I'll click OK. And you'll see down the left hand side here, you get the search folder created. You could sort of collapse and uh, hide this uh, as well. Um, but yeah, as the name suggests, if I now marked an email as unread, you'll see it appears in here as well. Um, and then as soon as I mark it as red and then click out and then click back in, you can see that that email has disappeared. So yeah, search folders are quite useful for just sort of pinging up certain things. Um, as I said, if you don't, if what you want to create isn't covered by the templates, you can click and create custom search folder. You sort of name it wherever you want um, and then you click criteria and you're given all these options to sort of choose from and play around with. Um, I won't cover it all because that will take way too much time. But yeah, it's some, something that I definitely recommend playing around with if you want to create a more sort of detailed search folder. Um, but yeah, let's go on to the next uh, feature, which is the delay delivery feature. Um, so if you find yourself in a scenario where you need to write out an email, but you don't want to send it until a specific time later on in the day or on uh, another day later on in the week. Um, you can basically do this using a feature called delay delivery. So to do this, you go to your new email. You write out your email. I'm going to write this out to myself um, and you give yourself a subject, obviously, and then your, your body of text. Um, so I've, I've got my email here. I'm ready to send it. I'm happy with it. I've got my subject, my message, my recipient, um, but I don't want to send it straight away. I want it to send today at five, let's say. Um, so to do this, you go over to options. And then you'll see this little delay delivery button here. So you click on that. Which will open up this new box for you. Um, and here you'll notice that this has already been ticked. So clicking delay delivery will tick this box automatically, um, which says do not deliver before. Um, as you can see by default, mine has already set itself to five today, um, but you can obviously change the date and the time that you want to send this email to uh, from. 
uh, well, what time you want to send an email. Um, so yeah, once you're happy with those settings, you sort of click close and then your delay delivery feature has been set up on this specific email. Um, if you decide after setting up the delay delivery that you don't want it on your email anymore, you can sort of click on it again and just untick the box and then that's the, the sort of delay delivery feature turned off for the email. It's as simple as that, but if you want to switch back on, you just tick it again. So um, yeah, I've turned on my delay delivery, so it's not going to send this email until five today. So I'm going to click send. And now you'll see if you go down to your outbox. That this email is just sat in my outbox and it will not leave until it hits five today. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is you need to have your Outlook open for this to work because it sits in your outbox. Your Outlook actually needs to be open on your computer at the time that you want it to send for it to actually send. If not, um, so say if I switched off my computer for the day and I switched back on the following day, it would then send it because obviously it's past 5 p.m. on the day that I wanted it to send. It would then send it. But yeah, if you want it to send specifically at an exact time, you need your Outlook to be switched on. Um, but yeah, that is the delay delivery feature. Um, cool. So the next thing that I want to talk about are quick steps. Um, so quick steps allow you to perform specific actions in Outlook uh, by clicking literally one button. Um, so for example, you can see here to get to quick steps, you go to home and then you see this little quick steps box here. This is this will show all your quick steps on your Outlook. Um, Outlook provides you with a few sort of default ones. So we've got to manager, which if I click that, so say if I highlighted this email and then click to manager, it would forward the email onto my manager uh, that's set in Outlook. Um, the team email will uh, create a new email that will send out to all your team members. Uh, the done button will mark the email as done. If you've got an email highlighted and then you click done, it will mark it as done. And the reply and delete button will basically just allow you to reply to an email and will then delete this email as well. So if I did that, I just click on reply and delete and then it would delete this out of my inbox and allow me to reply to it. Um, but yeah, those are the default ones that are given to you. You can create new quick steps though as well by clicking this little create new bot button here. Doing that will open this edit quick step box. Um, so I'm going to just create one. I'm going to call it test. Um, and down the left hand side here, I actually created a folder called test as well, as you can see. So what I want to set up in this quick step is I want to set up a quick step that will basically send an email to this test folder when I click on it. So if I click choose action, you'll see you've got a bunch of actions that you can choose from here with a bunch of different quick steps that you can set up. Um, but I want to use the move to folder, so I'll click move to folder. And then it will allow me to choose my folder, so I want to choose the test folder here. Um, and then yeah, that's essentially the quick step set up ready to go. Once you review all of this, if you're happy with it, you can click finish and it will create the quick step for you. Um, you can also set up keyboard shortcuts as well if you wanted to. So you click this. Um, and if I wanted, I could basically bind this quick step to control shift and one. So if I hit control shift and one on my keyboard, it would basically run through that quick step for me instead of going up here and clicking on the button. Um, but yeah, so once I'm happy with all that, I'll click finish. And you'll see the quick steps added up here. So I'll just show you in action. I want to move this email off to the test folder. So I'm just going to click on my quick step here and you can see it's gone. And if I go in my test folder, you can see it's been moved into there. So it's quite a little useful, useful thing, especially if you tend to move a lot of emails around or you tend to do the same sort of task a lot in Outlook. Quick steps allow you to like easily do that just by clicking one button. It streamlines, streamlines your workday a lot with that. Um, but yeah, let's move on to the next thing, which is rules. So um, an Outlook rule is uh, basically allows you to set up an event that will occur when a sort of specific action is met. Um, so I'll show you what I mean by this. Um, if you go to home and then go to this sort of rules drop down here, you can manage rules and alerts here. Um, clicking on this will open up a whole box for you where you can create new rules, change rules, copy rules, delete them. You could do it basically anything relating to rules in this box. Um, but I want to create a new rule. Um, so yeah, you click on that button and it'll open up this rules wizard. Um, and as you can see, you have a bunch of templates again from Outlook. Um, I want to set up a rule that's basically going to move any email that comes from my personal email address into that test folder automatically. 
Um, so I'm going to use the move messages from someone to a folder um, template that's provided. And once you highlight that, you can see down here you have all of the actual details on the rule. So it says um, apply this rule after the message arrives from and then it allows you to choose who you want it to come from. So I'm just going to type in my email address. If they're, if they're in your um, address book, you can also type up here, but I'm just going to type out my full email address here anyway. So once I'm happy with that, you can see it's set that from to myself and I want to move it to a specified folder. So I click on that and it will give me a list of all my folders. So I want those emails to move to the test folder. Click OK on that. And yeah, you can see that's changed there. So yeah, as, as you can see here, it literally just says any email that arrives from myself will be moved into the test folder. Um, and that's that rule basically set up and ready to go. But if you ever did want to set up a more detailed rule that sort of goes outside of these templates, you can add a lot more into it. So if you click next, you can see there's a bunch of conditions that you can apply to your rules. And then next again, you can see there's a bunch of actions as well. And then one more time, you can see there's a bunch of exceptions too. Um, they basically allow you to just sort of expand your rules and make them more, more uh, detailed if you ever need to. Um, but obviously I'm not going to go through all of this because you can see there is a lot of information here. Um, so I'll just click finish there. And then once I've done that, you can see this new rule has been created here. It's just been called Jordan Getley because it's moving an email from myself to there. Um, this tick means that the rule is active. So if you want to if you want to keep the rule, but you don't want it to run for a certain amount of time, you just untick that and it won't be running. Um, but I'm going to tick it and leave it running for a little while. Um, once I'm back with that, I just click apply. So yeah, basically any new email that comes in from myself will now get moved as this rule says. But if you ever create, so in this instance, if you ever create this rule and you wanted to move any sort of previous email in your out, uh, like inbox to the test folder as well, so anything that's arrived before setting up this rule, you can basically do this by hitting the run rules now bot button here, um, which gives you a list of all your rules. I've only got one at the moment, so I'm going to select this one. So you select your rule, you choose which folder you want it to run in. So I want to move anything in my inbox. Um, so I'll keep it selected as inbox and I want it to apply to all messages. You can also apply it to just unread or read messages as well, um, but I want it to do all messages and I'll just click run now. And then that basically runs the rule up against all sort of historic emails in your inbox as well. So you'll see that again, that email that was in there has just been moved to my test folder again through that rule. Um, so yeah, nice little feature there allows you to add a little bit of automation into your into your outlook uh, makes life a little bit easier sometimes especially if you uh, receive a lot of emails from a specific person and you want them to be set aside to a specific place in that specific example that I gave you um, but yeah those are outlook rules so um, the next feature that I want to go over is the start outlook in feature so by default when you load up your outlook you will see that it opens up your inbox first. You'll just see your inbox on your screen and that's that's that. But um, you can actually change which folder opens up first. So you can you can change it. So any of these will appear on your screen first or your calendar. Um, a lot of the time I see people set this to their calendar because some people like to see their calendar first thing in the morning before going into their inbox just so they can see what's planned ahead of their day, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, to do this, you go to file. Um, and then go down to options. And then that will open up this Outlook options box here. You want to go down to advanced. And then you'll see this start Outlook in this folder box here. Um, so as you can see, it's set to inbox. It will always be set to inbox by default. Um, so to change this, you want to click browse. And you'll see a long list of different folders in your Outlook. Um, but my specific example, I'm going to use the most common one that people change it to, which is calendar. I'm just going to select calendar and click OK, and then you'll see that's changed. So once I'm happy with that, I'll click OK on that. I'm just going to close my Outlook and then that's because something's in my inbox. Um, I'll close my Outlook and then I'm just going to reopen it again. Just to show you that it opens up in, in my calendar straight away now. So as you can see, since changing that setting, my calendar has just opened up straight away um, so I can basically basically see anything that's planned ahead of my day before actually going into into my inbox. Um, but yeah, that's that feature. Very, very useful if you wanted to customize where you look first. 
Um, but yeah, let's go into the next feature. So this is actually the final feature that I wanted to cover today, um, which is uh, the auto read feature. So with with your reading pane, if you sort of select an email that is set as unread and it appears in your reading pane here, you notice that as soon as you go off of that email, it will automatically mark it as read. Um, there is a feature or a setting that Outlook get, uh, provides which allows you to turn this auto read feature off. I know that um, I know for a fact that John Jordan used this quite a lot um, and loads of other people might find this beneficial if they tend to work in a shared mailbox together. So if you work in a shared mailbox with a bunch of your colleagues, you might find that you accidentally mark emails as read by um, having this auto read feature do that. Um, so it's useful to turn this off in that instance so people don't think that you've read an email when you haven't. Um, so to do this, you go to file, go back down to options, and again, you'll have this box appear again, um, and you want to go to advanced, and then click on this reading pane button here. Once you click on this, you'll have this box appear, and you basically just want to untick the mark item as read when selection changes. So you untick that, click OK, then click OK again. And if I mark these emails as read now, you can see that if I preview it in my um, reading pane and then go off of it, you can see that hasn't automatically marked itself as read. Um, the only ways that you can now mark these emails as read is by manually marking it as read through either method or if you double click it and open it up in a whole new window, so you open it up as a whole window and then close that, that will then also mark it as read. So it purely affects just the reading pane. So it sort of stops you from automatically marking things as read by accident. Um, but yeah, that is essentially all I wanted to cover today in regards to Outlook features and tips. Um, as Jordan said, there's a bit of a delay on the feedback here uh, between me talking and you receiving. So I will answer any questions that you have through the text chat as everyone else is presenting. Um, but yeah, I will pass you back to Jordan now. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jordan number two. Um, yeah, some you demoed those bits to us the other day and without being dramatic, quick steps has already changed my life. So thanks very much for that. Um, so next on to John Gosling to show us some tips and features of using Word. Over to you. Thank you. I can also vouch for um, quick steps changing my life. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, right, OK, so I haven't got quite as much detail as uh, Mr Getley, but I have quite a few bits. I think as um, Jordan number one has already said, there's quite a few features that we're demonstrating today that can be used across the platform and quite a few of these that uh, I'm not going to show can you can use in Excel, in Word, in PowerPoint and in Outlook. It's all about formatting really. Uh, the first feature I'm going to demonstrate is a, the, the dictate feature. This is in Outlook. This is in uh, Word and PowerPoint. You'll see this little button up here in Word. If you just click on it and then start talking, it will um, just write for you on the screen. So uh, hello and welcome to our platform to share event. Full stop. Today we are demonstrating some of the cool features available in the Office suite of applications. Full stop. I'm pleased to be able to demonstrate the dictate feature. Full stop. I'll just stop that now. You'll notice you have to pronounce um, punctuation, so full stop, you can do commas, semicolons, and things like that, speech marks, and it will automatically do all of that for you. So uh, that's one way if you like to talk and feel you talk better rather than typing, then that's a great way of getting information straight into Word. I'm going to, next I'm gonna demonstrate a random text generation feature within Word. There's a couple of these options in here. If you're creating a template document and you just want to put some text into play with rather than typing something, uh, Word can automatically generate that for you. So the first of these features, if you type equals uh, rand, uh, open bracket, close bracket, and press the return key, it will automatically generate, it'll pull some random text from the Microsoft support website and just pop it into your document. So pretty random, you've got some information there about video and stuff and so on and so on. 
if you want something a bit more traditional, you can do similar feature. You can equals rand dot old open bracket close bracket, and it brings up uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog uh, repetitively. If you would like some completely random words that, that aren't even words, you can type equals uh, lorem and then open brackets. This time I'm just going to demonstrate a feature you can use. This is what the brackets is for. I'm going to use it so um, on this one, but you can use it on the rand and the rand are old. Um, so you can enter a number. So I would like to have the first number would be paragraphs. So I'd like three paragraphs, uh, put a comma in and in each paragraph I would like three sentences, if I close the brackets now and press return, it generates lots of random text. So that generated my three paragraphs and each one had three sentences. So once you've got your text in your document, you might want to start playing with it and highlighting things. So to highlight a word, you can double click a word. So that's just a double tap on the mouse. You can highlight an entire sentence. Uh, you might like to think that that would be a triple click, but it's not. You hold the control key and select a word in a, in a note. That's the paragraph. Oh, man, that should have been the sentence. I thought it was a paragraph. There we go. Um, and to highlight the paragraph, it is three quick clicks. That didn't quite work for me. I don't know why that's happened. So there you go. If you hold control and select a word, it should do the whole sentence. And then the paragraph would be three quick clicks like that. Once you have your text selected, you can do things with it. So I might like to use the change case feature so I can, uh, if I haven't typed it properly or it's come from somewhere else, I can drop everything to lowercase. I can use this feature here to make everything uppercase. I can use this feature here to make everything to capitalize each word. Or to toggle the case completely if you've really messed up. Well, that does look a bit random. And if you just want to make it a sentence case, so put it back to capital letter at the beginning and no other capital letters, it will do that for you. You once you have text selected, uh, you can obviously copy and paste or cut and paste to move it around, but you can also drag. So once it's selected, you can I can just click and hold the mouse and just drag it around and I can say I would like that text to now be there. It works the same if I just select a word and I'd like to drag that word somewhere. I can do that around so you can drag and drop text. If you would like to change the font on your text, uh, you can use a shortcut key. I'm going to show you some of the shortcut keyboard, the, the keyboard shortcuts now. You can either use the box up here in the top of Word, um, or you can just hold Control key and hit the D key, and it brings up the font dialog box, in which case you've got plenty of things to play with. It will also show you what it looks like in the bottom there before you actually set it live. Um, I'm not going to select that one. Wingdings is probably not the right one to do either. There we go. Actually, just set that back. And there we go. So there's my text. Um, now, some of the other control features. So, using the control key is really handy within Word and Excel and Outlook. You can use the control A feature, which is to select all text. Great if you just want to delete everything in an email or something. Um, you can, if you want to cut text, out and move it somewhere else rather than use the drag and drop feature. I can do hold control and use the X key. It will cut the word. I can then go somewhere else in the document and hold control and V and that will paste that word somewhere else. I can. If you just like to copy a word or copy some text, I can say I will. Copy a word and control and C and I can go somewhere else in the document and again control and pay control and B to paste that document that that word somewhere else. If you want to do some quick highlighting. Uh, quick changes in, in in the font you can do control and B will change that font to bold. Control and I is italics and control and U will do an underline of that text for you. When you're formatting uh, or when you're just editing words um, and deleting stuff and, and editing, you can, when you hit the backspace key, obviously that will delete a word one letter at a time. If you hit the delete key, it will delete uh, the characters that are in front of your cursor one letter at a time. If you would like to speed that up a bit, if you hold the control key when using either of these buttons, so control and backspace will delete entire words behind you. And if you use the control key while hitting the delete button, it will delete entire words in front of the cursor.
if you've deleted something by mistake you just want to change that or go back you can use the undo feature there's also a redo feature so by holding the control key and hitting the z key it will undo your last action this is really handy if you've accidentally deleted some text somewhere in pretty much any document anything you've done it will any formatting it will do that if you then like to redo that uh, you can hold the control key and press y and that will redo what you've just done uh, the redo is really really uh, helpful for a lot of things so if you've just changed text to bold in one paragraph and i want to change that text to bold somewhere else um, I can come to some some other text and just use the control Y, the redo feature, and it will it will do exactly the same. Your last action, it will just redo that for you. So I've been editing a document. Uh, I've gone somewhere else in that document, and I can't remember where I was last editing. There's a feature that will bring you back to where you were last editing. This even works if you've closed the document and come back into the document in future. If you hold the shift key and press F5, it takes you to where you were last editing the document. Really handy. If you'd like to, there's a couple of little features here for breaking a document up. So putting a line across a document, you can either do this and it will put a line across there. But if you'd like that line to go across the whole screen to make it look nice, you can just do three hyphens, press the return key and it pops a line across. If you'd like a double line, you can hold the, you can do three equals symbol and press return and it will pop that across there as well. Okay, if, say for instance you're editing a document you've and you look at it and say okay this is a different slightly different font and this is a slightly different font and you want to start changing i like the font here and i want to put that font everywhere else in the document you can use the format painter so wherever your mouse is it'll take the format of the the font and everything you've done to that there so it's just this little icon at the top here if i click that now you'll see the cursor changes so it's like a little paintbrush on the cursor and I can highlight and go just run over the text I would like to change do that let go of the mouse and you'll see it's, it's taken that font and done that there is also a keyboard shortcut for this so if you hold control and shift and C it will copy that format of that text where you were and if I just highlight this text and do Control and Shift and V, so still using the C and the V from the copy and paste, uh, it will then just paste that format for me. Uh, OK, so if you would like, so sometimes when you write a document, you just need to be able to concentrate a little bit more. There's a really nice feature in Word, which is the focus feature. If it's just down here and what it does it just blanks out all of the distractions blanks out your taskbar blanks out the clock any notifications from outlook you can just click on the focus feature and it just allows you to just edit your document as you need to uh, so you can still type i can still select text delete whatever i want to do you can still do that without just without all of the nice all of the distractions if you'd like to come out of that you just press the escape key and it'll bring you back to where you were Another nice feature is you do need to suddenly change font or anything. If you go to the top, it will bring up your all the formatting, everything at the top there. But it just the focus feature is really nice of just removing distractions. Uh, so sometimes you might want to crop uh, an image or a screenshot and pop it into your Word document. You can go out and use the screen snip feature and copy and paste that. But there's a really nice way to do that uh, straight from within Word. If you go to insert and do screenshot, if you just click on screen screenshot, it will show you available windows that you have there. And so I can say, right, I want to copy this slide. I've got open another window. It just copies the entire window that was open for, for the platform to share there. The other part of this, I can click on insert screenshot and I can do screen clipping, um, which is really nice because it, it, it will take you to um, it will allow you to actually just take a clip of what you're seeing and so you probably can't see that i've got it on another screen sorry but i can just actually clip part of the screen that i would like to um, copy and put into my word document i'll just make that a bit smaller now obviously it fits into where the word the words are at the minute i can't just by default if I drag it around it looks a bit funny this is where the text wrap feature comes in really handy you see this little icon just to the top right here layout options if i select that and then select any of these as different ones you can have it behind the text and in front of the text or i can just have it tight which i, I think is a really nice feature it, 
if you click on that, it then allows you to just drag and drop this around and it just formats the word, puts the words around the actual the screen clip or the image, whatever you've got uh, around there. And this, this can work on anything you've copied and pasted or inserted into your document. I just think that's quite nice. Uh, where were we? Right, next. OK, we're nearly done. Um, just want to do a couple of little bits on bullet points. So I'm just going to remove, just remove that from my document completely. And so bullet points in Word uh, and any document are really helpful. If I'm just going to select some text there and I'm going to create some bullets to work with. If you can just have standard bullet points, you can have numbered bullet points, you can have numbered bullet points, but then different formats for when you start to indent the library. So I can do that. And then as I click here and press the tab key, you'll start to see it numbers as you tab each time in. To tab backwards, you hold the shift key and the tab key, it will tab you back to where you were. Uh, a really nice feature in bullet points, if you want to move bullet points around in numbering, before I knew this, I used to copy and paste or cut the point and paste it somewhere else, but you can actually uh, hold the Alt key and the Shift key and just press up and down and it'll move it around your bullet points. If you press left and right, you can indent in and out as well. So it's a really nice little feature there to just a quick moving things around. OK, and then my final point before we and back to Jordan is on the find and replace feature. Uh, really handy. So if you just want to find a word or some text in your document, if you hold the control key and hit the F key, it brings up the navigation window. So you can see where I've done a demonstration to myself earlier. I've typed in Fox. And it brings up all the references to Fox on the left hand side and you can click through the document and look through the document about where that word appears. If you'd like to start doing a replace of them, so I don't really want to have Fox in here. I actually meant to write cat. I can get rid of the navigation window and I can click on the editing window and go um, replace. So that brings up on another screen, hold on. So I can find a word, I can find Fox and I can replace it with cat. If I just do replace once, it will just replace it once. There you go. It'll replace the next one in the list, so depending on where your cursor is. I might not want to do that one, but I can click on find next. Or I can just hit the replace all button. So anytime you see the word fox in a document, hit replace all, and it'll just change it to cat. So now the quick brown cat. Um, oh yeah, that's missing a word because I've dragged some stuff around. And so the quick brown cat jumps over the lazy dog. Right, I think that's about it from me. So thank you very much. I'll hand back to Jordan. Stop sharing my screen. Great, thanks John. Um, I think there was loads of handy tips in there and I know John did mention as well, but they are all really useful tips that you can use across the office suite. So especially things like Outlook and the dictation feature could potentially save quite a bit of time for people that like to write long emails when a few of those people. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think there was a couple of questions. I'll let John just answer those as we move through the rest of the webinar. Um, there will be a follow up document that Sam will create and send round so she can add some of those um, shortcut features to that document as well so that you have that. No problem. Um, OK, so on to Jack Fisher, who is going to demo PowerPoint for us. Thanks. OK, thanks very much. Just managed to unmute myself there. Um, so I'm going to run through a few PowerPoint tips and tricks with you. Um, we're going to start with just a blank PowerPoint presentation. And we're going to kind of build it up from there. Um, I know we've only got 15 minutes, so it's going to be I'm going to go through things at a fairly quick pace. Um, so the first thing which you can do is over on the right hand side, you'll see that Microsoft come up with a load of design ideas, quite a topical one there with some snow on it. Um, so you can set different design ideas on your slides here. Um, but the thing is, if you then create a new slide, it's actually just a blank slide and then you'd have to go back to your design idea to do it. 
So there's actually a way you can do global changes here. So I'm going to click up on the view menu at the top and then I'm going to go into Slide Master. Now Slide Master lets you make global changes to your entire presentation. Microsoft, the first, so the first thing you can do is add a theme to everything. So Microsoft have a load of built in themes here, which actually some of them look, look pretty good. Um, and you can pick one that's kind of better to your presentation. Um, and as you can see on the left, it will show you what the different types of uh, slides will come out as. So I actually got Sam to do us a breakwater theme. So you can click, sorry, I should have said, you can click through on the themes here and go to browse for themes if you've got one saved on your computer. I've got it in the downloads and then I just double click on the BWIP presentation theme. As you can see, that sort of, again, means that every slide in your presentation is going to take on this theme. Um, another thing you can do is quite easily drag a logo in from your computer. So if you say you have a Explorer window open, um, you can copy the Breakwater IT logo and you can hit paste. Um, I'm going to remove this in a second because obviously it's got the, the wrong colour theme with it and Sam's already designed me a great logo up in the top right, but that would mean that it then again shows on each slide that you create down here. So I'm just going to move that from there. Um, but that's the slide master for you. So if you click close slide master, you can see my main one here. If I type platform share in there, if I now create a new slide, it will automatically have my theme applied to it. So you don't have to go in and go and design each slide for you. Um, I'm just going to quickly jump straight back in there a second because you can set your fonts, etc. So if you were to select the bit of text in here and then click on fonts at the top. Let's say we picked Cambria, close the slide master, then all my fonts and everything I type in here will then keep the same font throughout your presentation. So that's making a global change. Now the next bit I'm going to do is put, insert some images and do some animations on them. Now Microsoft have designed a load of stock images for you, which are actually really good. So I'm going to click on the insert option up at the top here. I'm actually going to pick a 3D model because you can. I'll show you how you can sort of manipulate that image and then put some quite funky animations on it. So. If you've got, if, if, if you're a design company, you designed your own 3D models, you can insert them here, but I'm just going to pick one from Microsoft stock. So I'm going to go to the Microsoft products and I'm going to pick Microsoft mouse, which is actually the mouse that I'm using today, as you can see. So hit insert down here and that just pops it in the middle of my slide. Now you can see the little, the funky little arrow here in the middle. You can click on that and then drag the image to wherever you want. So you can show the underside of it over the top. You can drag it in any direction that you want. Um, and leave it at that. Now, if I click it again and click on animations at the top here, there's a whole host of um, ones that are in yellow here that will actually. Bring the image to life. So whilst you're talking, when you click on this slide, you can select something like turntable. So the image will just continuously rotate round. Um, you can have it swing back and forth. Or our favourite one is jump and turn. So it will jump and it really brings that slide to life, I think. Um, you can also change the effects upon that animation. So once you've picked your animation in here, you can change the direction that it jumps and joins in. So it can go that way, it can go counterclockwise. Uh, you can do it from the right etc. You can also change the intensity here. So if you only want it to be a little jump and turn, you can do that. Moderate was what we were on before, but then let's go for some strong intensity. It almost jumps off the page when it comes back in. Um, so that's just a nice way that you can animate 3D models within your PowerPoint. So the next thing, sticking on the sort of animation theme, I'm going to do some animations with multiple images and some text. So to do that again, I'm going to come up to the top, go to insert. I'm just going to pick some pictures from the stock images again. 
And again, there's loads of different types of things that you can use cut out people that you can put next to images. You can have them pointing at things. There's a bunch of stickers and illustrations. Um, I'm just going to go with some icons today. I'm going to pick, say, a pasta, an aeroplane, and an ant. So I've clicked insert on all of those. Just going to click off them. I'm going to click one image. I'm going to drag it over here. I'm going to drag the next image out here. I'm going to drag that one there. Now, as I said, I want to add in some text next to each icon in there. So I'm going to come over here on the insert tab at the top. I'm going to click text box. I'm just going to drag a text box in there. Now, one thing I am going to do, because I think you might not be able to see that very well, I'm going to come back in the Slide Master and show you another quick feature in there, which is background styles. So if I select white, for instance, but I need to do that on my top slide. And I'm going to close that and then you can actually see the text a little better there. So back to doing this, I want to then put a text box next to each uh, icon. So the quickest way is if I click on it and select that text box and much like John was saying, control C. Oh, I've still got the image selected there, so bear with me. But if I hit control C and then control V, brings another text box in there. And if I hit control V again, get one more. So I'm going to put that there. And then I'm just going to quickly change the words around there. Now, as you can see, they're slightly out of alignment here. Um, now you can stand there and drag them around and try and line them up and it just put up some handy little lines on the screen for you. But if you just want everything to be aligned on the document with you, you can hold down the control button and click on each thing. So I've now got all of the images and all of the text box selected. Now there is on the arrange button up at the top here, you can go down to align, but sometimes it's hard to actually find what's at the top along those bars because there's so many things. So the search function, in Office, this is across all the Office products, is actually really powerful. And if you can't find it for any reason, you can just start typing what you're trying to do, and it's really good and pop up what you're trying to do there. So I am going to click a line, and then I'm going to just align them all in the middle, and they're all now nicely, neatly lined up across the slide. So as I said, I want this, when I'm actually pre presenting this slide, I want it to be done on click. So if I click the Next button, if I'm using a clicker, I want the animation to pop in. Um, so the, the quick way is you click on the first image and you come up to your animations tab at the top again and you can click. There's loads of different ones here um, and you can set different ones on how they appear um, or how they disappear. Um, I'm going to just use the ones along the top so you can have them appear. You can then click on your next bit. So if you want it to be, let's have the plaster come in first, then a bit of text. And the and then the next bit of text, the plane, and then the next bit of text. Uh, you can click on each one in turn, and you'll see that a little number starts to come up next to them. So I'm going to have that one float in. Just going to pick different ones for each one, so you can see the different effects when we go into the presentation mode of it. Have that one float in, and we're going to have that one appear with random bars. So if I let's say quickly go to slideshow at the top. And then from the current slide, obviously you're seeing the notes section here um, on the actual presentation on the other screen is just the slide. But as I hit either the arrow key or if I was using a click at that, then in comes the first image and then in comes the next bit of text. And each time it comes through like that. Now I'm just going to jump out because what you might want to do is actually have each image and its text appear at the same time. So that's relatively easy. Again, I'm using the control button. So I hold down control. I click on my image and my text. And then I can go to animations again and I can say I want them to appear together. 
And if you notice the little numbers on the animations now, they both have a one next to it. So I'm going to do the same for the next one. I'm going to have them floating together. And then on the next one, again, I'm holding control, clicking on picture and the text, and then selecting the animation that I want. We'll go for a wheel on that one. Um, you can also do all this through the animation pane. So again, at the top here is animation pane, and you can click on here and you can select the which ones you want to come in and, and what action you want them to do. So you could start it with the previous one. You could start it after the previous one. And there's timing effects here as well. So you can set the duration of how long you want it to take to come in. You can set a delay feature on it. So when you hit it, there can be a delay before it actually pops up on the screen. Um, I'll just close that and quickly show you what it looks like now. So slideshow again from the current slide. And now when I hit the clicker, each one will appear with its text next to it. Conscious that we are running out of time. So whilst I'm in this mode, I'm going to go back in to a new slide. Quickly grab a bit of text. And then I'm just going to paste that into this slide. So if I go into slide show here. From the current slide. Now, the text is actually quite small, so if you have that up on the big screen and say you're in a room with lots of people at the back who aren't going to be able to see it and you need to zoom in on something, you can hit this zoom in to the slide button. You can select the bit of text that you want to zoom into and hit, hit just click your mouse and then it zooms right into there. So on the big screen that zooms right in. Um, pretty self-explanatory that one. So the next bit I'm going to do is the final feature. Let's create a new slide. And I'm just going to paste some notes in so you can see what it looks like. On my screen. So you can click on the little notes button down at the bottom here. Paste in the notes and I'm going to start the slide. Now the button I'm going to use here is the subtitles. So I'll put that on and then you can see subtitles should start appearing at the top of the screen and on the presentation they do as well. So captions in PowerPoint for Microsoft 365 can transcribe your words as you present and display them on the screen as captions in the same language that you are speaking or as subtitles translated to another language. So this can help accom accommodate individuals in the audience who may be deaf or hard of hearing or more familiar with another language respectively. There's a, you can also set position, size, colour and other appearance options for the captions and subtitles to accommodate different environments and audience needs. So ever so quickly jumping out of presentation mode and we'll just quickly show you the subtitle settings here. Now my spoken language is always English. I'm not going to try and refer to my GCSE Spanish or French because I'm not very good at it. But if I just hit Dutch on the subtitle language. And then go back into from current slide toggle my subtitles on again and I'll just read some of this. So for the best results, Microsoft highly recommend using a headset microphone connected to the device running PowerPoint. Also, the feature requires a reliable internet connection throughout your presentation. So as you can see, the uh, subtitles are now all in Dutch. I don't know if anyone here can speak Dutch, but if you can, you can verify that Microsoft are doing a good job there. So um, that's pretty much it. There are three little handy tips that Microsoft say uh, you should always keep in mind when using subtitles and they are if you start to see problems on the captions or subtitles try speaking more deliberately uh, try to avoid or eliminate background noise that may interfere with your voice and also it's important to remember that captions and subtitles depend on a cloud-based speech service so it's important that you've got a really solid internet connection that's fast and reliable um, that is it with me and PowerPoint. So I will hand back to Jordan. Great, thank you, Jack. Uh, I think that was really interesting. I've always found PowerPoint quite intimidating, but you've made it a little less scary. So thanks very much for that. <laughs> Um, and the search bar, that was a really key thing to mention, actually, that's something that I use a lot um, to find um, something I'm trying to do within Word or PowerPoint or whatever I'm using really. So that is very useful. 
so yeah so that is all from us thank you everyone for taking the time to join our webinar today we hope it, you found it useful um, even if you've got one or two takeaways from that that's going to be a win for us and it makes it worth it uh, so again Sam will be sending around a feedback questionnaire feel free to add any suggestions for future events we really want to make these as useful and as relevant as possible for you all She'll also include a breakdown of the points covered today and a link to the recording of this session. Um, any further questions you may think of, feel free to drop me or one of the guys an email. We'll get back to you when we can. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. And thanks team. See you all soon. <laughs>